Self-Portrait by F.T. Marinetti from F.T. Marinetti's Critical Writings. I had a strange, colorful, uproarious sort of light. I started off with rose and black, a blossoming, healthy little tot in the arms and between the carbon coke breasts of my Sudanese nurse, which maybe explains my somewhat blackish concept of love and my open antipathy toward milk and honey politics and diplomacy. My father's Piedmontese tenacity was passed on to me in the blood. It is to him that I owe the great strength of his willful, domineering, sanguine temperament. But fortunately, I have not inherited his dense tangle of spiritual argument, nor his fantastic memory, which made him in his time the greatest civil lawyer, civil law lawyer in Alexandria. On certain evenings down there in the witchery of Africa, they would take us on to your dark, deserted beaches, a doleful flock of boarders who crept along, placid and slow, watched over by our priests stricken black. Little blots of ink, we were against the immaterial silks of a divine oriental sky. My mother, who was entirely composed of the most delicate musical poetry of affectionate tears and tenderness, was Milanese. Though born in Alexandria, I feel myself bound to Milan's forest of chimneys and its ancient cathedral. O oh, Cathedral of Milan, I have terrified you, brushing with my seagull's wings against the monstrous steep slopes of your age-old cliffs. You say I am a Milanese in too great a hurry. When I was six, I was often severely scolded when I was caught red-handed, spraying passerby from our balcony. They weren't exactly passing by. Rather, were these solemn Arab merchants standing around, extending their lengthy, ceremonious greetings with their backs arching their salams beneath their many colored turbans, avid, avidly bargaining for Parisian bed linen and chests of fruit with Jewish brokers and camel drivers. On one side, my father's house in Alexandria looked out onto a busy street, and on the other onto a huge walled garden that was filled with palm trees, fans gently waving against the foamy blue laughter of the African sea. I lived out my days on a tiny wooden balcony in a dreamy sort of closeness, with some fat turtle doves, which perched up among the date palms, just a couple of meters from me, cooed away melodiously, perhaps preparing my ears for their future sensitivity to sounds. When the noise of the merchants talking disturbed my friends, the doves, I would turn on the tap of my childish liquid scorn down among them. For a long time at the French Jesuit school of St. Francis Xavier, all I ever learned was how to play soccer, and the fight with any of my classmates who said anything against Italy. Many times my terrified mother would find me covered in blood as a result of these furious games. I was just 14 when Father Buffern, my humanities teacher, solemnly announced one day in class that a description of mine of the dawn was far superior to any of those written by Chateaubriand and predicted my glory as a very great poet. I evinced a mad passion for Mary, a sweet 14-year-old girl who was a pupil at a nun's school next to my college. From the Levant, with her large licorice eyes, her camellia cheeks, her fleshy, sensual lips, slinky, tender, all woman already, sly and full of malice. To kiss her, I climbed onto the shoulders of my Arab servant every day, and after having cut myself on the sharp glass shards on a wall top, I would wait among the branches of a fig tree until she could slip away without the nuns noticing. But sometimes up in the fig tree, there would be chameleons with me, drinking in the heat of the afternoon. Trying to get a better look at one of them one day, I lost my balance and fell, dislocating my shoulder. The love for Mary was all mixed up with the terrible crisis I was in over mysticism. From being 14 to when I was 16, I was the adolescent who submitted the stirrings of his feeble body to the voluptuous embrace of the evening, to the scent of incense and sweetened hosts. When the month of Mary came to visit us in the parlor like a perfumed lady more beautiful than the sisters of my friends. But the religious constraints of my teachers, the Jesuits, rather than supporting my mystical urges, cut them down. I was expelled from the college for having brought in some of Zola's novels. I got myself into debt for the first time in my life in order to set up my first journal, Le Papyrus, which was brimful of romantic poetry and anti-clerical invectives against the Jesuits. However, I found myself in the impossible situation of not being able to continue my classical studies in Alexandria, much to the fury of my father, who felt compelled to pack me off to Paris. 
alone in Paris at 18 years of age, evenings in the Latin Quarter, with all the ladies of easy virtue at my disposal, and all the usual student upsets, a disastrous examination in mathematics, but a triumphant one in philosophy on the theories of Stuart Mill. I arrived in Milan at Bachelor A Lettres with a French culture, though incontrovertibly Italian, and that despite all the temptations of Paris. While I was reading for my degree in law at the University of Genoa, one of my poems written in free verse, Le Vieux Marine, which had been published in the Anthology Review, was awarded a prize by Catal Mendez and Gustav Kahn, the directors of Sarah Bernhardt's Samadis Populaire, and was then gloriously recited by the great actress herself in her own theater. With the little money allowed to me by my father, sworn enemy of all my literature, I, da I dashed off to Paris. My entry into the literary circles there represented the acclaimed rise of a new young great poet, the doors of the publishing houses were open to me. Editors and journals were entirely deferential. My literary campaign throughout Italy then began to unfold, promoting both French symbolism and decadentism, with endless lectures in which I introduced Baudelaire, Malarme, Verlaine, Rimbaud, Lafford, Gustave Kahn, Claudel, Paul Fort, Verheren, and Jeans to Italy. The establishment and development of the International Review Poesia then followed, a teeming hothouse in which our best young poets germinated and burst into flower. Cavaccioli, Paolo Buzzi, Gavoni, Palesci, Gian Pietro Lucini, and Luciano Fogore. Thus it was in 1905 futurism was born. I was the much acclaimed author of La Conquête des Etoiles, Conquest of the Stars a poem far from the realistic. Nevertheless, I followed all the disturbances and ideological developments of the Italian socialist movement very closely, and these crystallized into my tragedy, La Wave Bombax, King Guzzle. This fat-bellied king of mine stormed onto the Parisian stage, already bearing the scandal of futurism and his symbols and grotesque actions. For a whole month, Paris was violently shaken by the revolutionary truculence of this work and by the arguments raging back and forth about the Futurist Manifesto, which appeared in Le Figaro, as well as about my sword gash, dealt me in a duel with the novelist Charles Henry Hirsch. The Parisian papers dubbed me the caffeine of Europe. 